morning. Um, I'd like to call to order the Mayor Commission work session. Today is October 15th, and the time is 10.05 a.m. And uh, first item is a State of the Police Pension Report by Jeff Amrose. Well, good morning, everyone. It's nice to be here with you today. Um, my name is Jeff Amrose, and I work with uh, Gabriel Ritter Smith and Company. I'm an actuary for about 25 years, and I've been serving as a consulting actuary for the West Palm Beach Police Officers Pension Plan for about nine years. So today, I'm here to give you an update on the state of the West Palm Beach Police Officers Pension Plan. <clears throat> I'm going to try to keep my talk to less than two and a half hours. I'll do my best. Um, that would be a good idea. <laughs> um, in all seriousness, I'll, I'll be taking probably 15 minutes if that's okay with everyone. Um, but you know, the, the, the plan's in good shape, so I think we could, we could do that in 15 minutes. shouldn't be a problem. Um, as some of, you, some of you may remember, <clears throat> I was here in last June to discuss the West Palm Beach Police Pension, pension Plan. And since that time, there's actually been further strengthening of the retirement plan. And we'll go into the reasons how that happened um, in a short while. Um, it was not too long ago that the pension plan had some issues. In 2014, the required city contribution was elevated to about $10 million and was increasing each year. The funded ratio, which is one measure of the health of a retirement plan, was decreasing each year. <clears throat> the level of benefits was being reduced as state money was going to help fund the pension plan instead of going to the police officer's share plan account. But since 2014, as I've told you last year, there's been very significant changes in the health of the retirement plan. Today we'll discuss the two main reasons for the improved health of the retirement plan. One, the issuance of a $50 million pension obligation bond. We'll talk about how that's played out for the city. And number two, the very strong investment returns that the pension plan has seen um, for the last 10 years. And we'll also talk about the current level of the required city contribution where that contribution is expected to go in future years. We'll talk about the plan's funded ratio, and we'll do a sort of a, a very high level comparison of the benefits provided to the police officers here to other pension plans across Florida. Um, but before we discuss these items, let me give you a quick introduction into the pension plan benefits that are provided to the police officers here in West Palm Beach. So basically, there's three different uh, retirement plan benefits that a West Palm Beach police officer can accrue during his or her career. Um, these are the regular pension benefit, a drop account balance, and a share plan account balance. The regular pension benefit is calculated of, as the product of three numbers. It's basically the police officer's service times their pay times a benefit multiplier. So let's discuss what the benefit multiplier means. The benefit multiplier is for each year of service, before two, October 1, 2011, they accrued 3% for each year. Between October 1, 2011 and October 1, 2017, they, were, they accrued 2.68% um, of pay each year. And then after October 1, 2017, they accrued 3% of pay um, each year. The pay used in the formula is the best three years of pensionable earnings. Another important plan provision for the regular benefit is the normal retirement date. When can the police officer start his or her benefit? When can they start receiving it? Um, well, that's defined in the uh, special act, and it is the earlier of age 55 with 10 years of service, age 50 with 20 years of service, or 25 years of service. Uh, to help the city fund this benefit, the police officers themselves contribute 11% of their pay each year. The second pension benefit for police officers at West Palm Beach is a drop balance. DROP stands for a Deferred Retirement Option Program. Uh, when a police officer reaches normal retirement, they have three options. What they could do is, um, A, they could continue working as a police officer in West Palm Beach, and if they do, they'll accrue a higher pension benefit. Or B, they could terminate employment and start receiving their pension benefit. Or C, they can enter the, the DROP. If the police officer enters the DROP, their regular pension benefit is calculated at that time. The regular pension benefit will not be paid to the officer while he or she participates in the drop program. Some other, uh, actually, instead of getting paid that benefit to them, the payments will be accumulated in an account and credited with investment earnings. Uh, the earnings will basically range from 4% to 8%, depending on how the fund is doing. 
If the average return since 2011 is less than 8%, the interest crediting rate on the drop drops to 4%. Otherwise, it stays at 8%. Um, some other features of the drop is that the member agrees to terminate employment with the city at the end of the drop period. So a member, if they make the decision to join the drop program, they must terminate employment within five years because that's the maximum drop period is five years. Um, there is no forced distribution of the drop account when a member terminates employment. The third benefit uh, for West Palm Beach police officers is a share plan. The share plan is funded by state money only. The amount of state money contributed to the share plan is based on tax collections on casualty insurance policies inside the city limits of West Palm Beach. Um, the state money was approximately $1.46 million in 2018 for West Palm Beach, um, and each member received about $5,200 each, uh, roughly. That, that was the average um, amount for each member. It's important to note that state money for 2012, 2013, and 2015 was used to fund the pension plan instead of going to the share plan accounts. That's what I was talking about earlier. Um, slide six through eight review the actual calculations of these three benefits. Um, I don't want to take the time to go through them, but if you ever have a question on that, you could always feel free to give me a call and I'd be happy to go through it with you. So now let's shift gears and talk about the funding of the pension plan. The major event that took place in July of 2016 was the issuance of the $50 million pension obligation bond. The proceeds of the bond were used to pay off about 90% of the unfunded accrued liability. The unfunded accrued liability is basically that shortfall between the assets in the plan and the liability in the plan. And we, we took away basically 90% of that shortfall by putting that $50 million into the pension plan. As a result of the pension obligation bond, the funded ratio increased from 82.4% up to 97.1%. The unfunded accrued liability decreased from $56.7 million down to $9.5 million. And the annual amortization payment on the unfunded accrued liability decreased by $6.5 million. So over a three-year period, the issuance of the pension obligation bond has worked out very well for the city. The city is paying bondholders interest of 3.5% per year and the earnings on the proceeds of the pension obligation bond, which were put into the pension plan, have earned about 10% per year. So the success in general of a pension obligation bond really depends on timing. The timing has worked out very well for the city right now. Um, the investment return on the $50 million deposited into the pension plan has been roughly, <clears throat> excuse me, $13 million since July of 2016. The interest that's been paid to the bondholders um, has been about $5 million, which means that the, the city is $8 million ahead of the game right now um, on that strategy to issue the pension obligation bond. As discussed earlier, it's not only the pension obligation bond, it's also the strong investment earnings that the pension plan has seen um, in recent years. So over the last seven years, you can see the return that the uh, pension plan has experienced, and the average return is 11.3% over those seven years listed there. Um, the board has adopted the entry age normal funding method to determine the required city contribution each year. It's a very common funding method. I'm not going to go into great detail about it, but it's used by 80 to 90 percent of the plans that I work on. So it's very common, very transparent. Um, under this funding method, there are two parts of the required city contribution. First part is the employer normal cost. And essentially what that represents is the value of the accruals from the active members each year. It should say fairly level as a percentage of payroll. Um, the second part is of the required city contribution are the amortization payments on the unfunded accrued liability. Uh, changes in the unfunded accrued liability that occur as a result of a plan change or experience gains and losses or assumption changes are not paid for immediately. The plan, plan doesn't experience a loss and have to put, the city doesn't have to put all that money in. They get to amortize that over a period of time not to exceed 30 years. So let's look at the level of the two parts of the required city contribution as shown in our last valuation report, our October 1, 2018 report. The column to the right shows the results from our 2017 valuation report, and one column to the left of that is the results from the 2018 valuation report before reflecting any assumption changes. So let's focus on the right two columns, and you'll see that the employer normal cost was 14.63% of pay in 2017, and then 14.61% um, of pay in 2018. So just what we said before, that the, the normal cost represents the value of the accruals. It's going to stay pretty level as a percentage of pay unless you're changing something with the plan. Um, the second part of the required city contribution, which is the amortization payments on the unfunded accrued liability, 
also remained very level as a percentage of payroll. Um, last year, in 2017, it was 4.72%. This year, in 2000, or I should say in 2018, it was 4.69%. So the required city contribution was 19.35% in the 2017 report and 19.30% of pay in the 2018 report before we reflected any assumption changes. <coughs> yeah, I have a... Sorry, yeah. So l l let me explain that. Um, I'm talking about the 2000... <laughs> Great question. Um, the 2017 report is represented by the rightmost column. That determines the required city contribution for fiscal year ending 19. So in that report, and then the same for a 2018 report determines the required city contribution for fiscal year ending 20. Sorry about that. That, that is confusing, but hopefully that clears it up. <clears throat> so the board did approve lowering the investment return assumption by 12 and a half basis points down from 7.75% down to 7.625%. Um, and that's shown in the third column from the right, that change down to 7.625%. And as a result of lowering the investment return assumption, the required city contribution increased from $4.91 million in our, before reflecting any changes, up to $5.44 million. So it was an increase of $530,000 um, as a result of lowering the investment return assumption. And we'll get to what, why that decision was made in a short while. Um, the $5.44 million is the final required city contribution if the payments are made quarterly. And again, it's the 2018 valuation report, but it's for fiscal year ending 20, the one that just started uh, last week. So th for, for this fiscal year that we're currently in, the required city contribution is $5.44 million if the payments are made quarterly. If the city chooses to front load that whole contribution and make it as of the beginning of the year, which was last week actually, so October 1, 2019, the contribution would be $5.24 million. All right, so let's review the two components of the required uh, city contribution for fiscal year ending 2020. The normal cost is 15.38% of pay or $3.91 million. This is often referred to as the operational costs of the pension plan. The annual amortization payments on the unfunded accrued liability is 6.01% of covered payroll or $1.53 million. The unfunded accrued liability is $19 million as of October 1, 2018. And remember, it was $56.7 million in 2015 before the issuance of the pension obligation bond. So after the unfunded accrued liability is fully paid off, the, plan will, the plan's cost, the, the required city contribution, will migrate to the employer normal cost. Because you're going to pay off the, the second component of cost, you're only going to be left with the first component. Um, so there are, uh, that will only happen if there are no changes in plan provisions and the actual assumptions are set in such a way that there are gains and losses that cancel each other out over time. Uh, the more accurate the actual assumptions are, the more closely they, they, they match the actual experience of the plan, that will lead to a higher probability of actual gains and losses offsetting each other, and the cost of this plan will migrate to the normal cost, because you won't have that second part of the contribution. Um, effective with the 2018 valuation, the board voted to lower the investment return assumption from 7.75 to 7.625%. And the investment return assumption will be lowered again with our 2019 valuation report by 12 and a half basis points down to 7.5%. As a result, we know the required city contribution in our 2019 report will increase by roughly 525 to $550,000. So let's just discuss things that we know about the required city contribution in future years. There's a lot we don't know, but at a very high level, the, the required city contribution is going to be dictated largely by the investments of the plan. If we have some more investment years like we've had for the last 10 years, it's going to be more downward pressure on the required contribution for the city. If we have years like we experienced from 2000 through 2010, it's going to be upward pressure on the city contribution. But that's just at a very high level. There are things that we know for sure. First thing is the required city contribution will increase, as I just said, <clears throat> by 500, about 525 to 550,000 next year as a result of lowering that investment return assumption to 7.5%. Due to asset smoothing, there are $13.2 uh, $13 million of unrecognized investment gains. That's good news. We have gains, investment gains, that we didn't recognize. We're smoothing the returns each year, so we have good news to recognize in future years. That'll put some downward pressure on the required city contribution. And to give you a sense, if we just said, well, let's recognize those $13 million of unrecognized gains today, the required city contribution will go down by $1.2 million. 
So it's good news. We, we know we have 1.2 million dollars of downward pressure on the required contribution. Now that's as of our last valuation report, October 1, 2018. Well, we're done with the 2019 year. I don't have the exact return, but the actual return that the plan experienced did not meet the assumption um, of 7.5%. It was lower, it was probably closer to 2%. Um, so we will have some investment losses, but it's gonna offset the unrecognized investment gain position we were in. So you know, we, we had this buffer here, and that's what it's there for. So when we have a, a, a bad year, it wasn't a horrendous year, um, but we only got a couple percent, we needed to get to seven and a half to meet the assumption. Well, we, we have a loss, but that's what that $13 million is for. Well, you know, that'll be offset and be, be lower, but it won't uh, hurt the plan like it would have if we didn't have those, those gains. So just a couple more slides. Uh, let's talk about the funded ratio. The funded ratio is simply defined as what percentage of the liability is covered by the plan assets. As of October 1, 2018, the funded ratio is 95.1%. Um, remember, before the pension obligation bond was issued, it was 82%. And to give you a sense, I have um, about 90 plans on my, uh, on my team, and the average funded ratio for those plans is in, in the mid to upper 80% range. So the funded ratio for this plan, one measure of the health of a retirement system, is at a very good, good level. So as discussed last year, the special act was amended by increasing the benefit multiplier uh, from 2.68% for each year of service to 3% to for each year of service. A 3% benefit multiplier is closer to the average of other public safety plans in Florida. So remember, the, the employer normal cost <coughs> represents the value of the annual accruals, less member contributions. So comparing the employer normal cost rates of different plans provides just a general sense of the level of benefits provided for West Palm Beach Police versus other neighboring uh, cities pension plans in Florida. So based on the results shown on this slide, um, you can see that the employer normal cost for West Palm Beach Police is at the lower end of the range compared to other public safety plans in Florida. Um, of course, there it's not exact. You can't just look at this and say, oh, we're, we're in this place or that place, because they're all using different assumptions, and the assumptions do skew the results um, somewhat. But in general, I think that uh, you know, the West Palm Beach Police pension benefits are on the lower end compared to other Florida pension plans. So with that being said, I will turn it over to see if there are any questions or issues that you'd like to discuss. <coughs> Let me ask a general question. Sure. Um, are there any ticking time bombs uh, of which we should be aware? Yeah. Uh, related to that, how many more years is left on the police pension bond? About 26, 20? That information, it's outside of the pension plan, so I don't have that information. I don't know if anyone else in the room is able to. Mr. Parks, do you know? Yeah, Mayor, we. Um, you got to talk him to the mic. Mark Parks, CFO. We got the bond in 2015. It was a 20 year bond. All right. So it's about 15 years left. Okay, okay. Anyway, but back to the. Sure. Thank you, Mr. Sure. Parks. Back to the general question. Are there any ticking time bombs of which we should. Be aware. There, there's always things to be concerned about with the pension plan. I'm sorry, not, 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 I mean, I'll tell you right now, if the assumptions play out each year, which we know they won't exactly, but in general, over a 20, 30 year period, if, if they happen as we're expecting, it's going to be fine. We're going to have, you know, pretty level percentage of pay contributions. Ticking time bomb is we repeat what happened investment wise, not just for this pension plan, but all pension plans across the country from 2000 through 2009. That's certainly a ticking time bomb because the contribution is going to go way up. Um, so that's that, and it'll make that that not not the bet, but but the strategy of issuing the pension obligation bond. It'll make what looks great now. It'll make it look pretty poor if, if we re revisit a 10-year period of investments like we did from 2000 through 2009 or 10. Okay, thank you. Sure, uh, Commissioner Neering. Thank you, Mayor. Uh, glad this wasn't a Monday morning presentation. <laughs> Tuesday. So, a quick question sure. regarding the uh, pension obligation bond. The unrealized, the 13 million, so we said approximately 5 million yeah. investors and then the 8 million. Sure. Is any portion of the unrealized funds um, obligated to the pension fund or is that already calculated in, in our, um, in other words, how's that being paid back? How are we, are we paying back the pension obligation yeah, bond? Exactly. It's not outside, the, it, it's not coming General from revenues. the pension plan, it's outside the pension gotcha. plan. Gotcha. Okay. So not, nothing, there'll be no, 
payments from the pension plan to pay the bondholders. I think that's what, yep. what, what you're getting yep. at. Yeah, it's not coming, it's coming from general assets, I gotcha. assume, or, or, or some other okay. city fund. Okay, thank you. Madam President. Thank you, thank you for the presentation. Sure. <clears throat> I, excuse me. <clears throat> I understand we're at 95.1 of our funded ratio, <clears throat> <laughs> and um, you're saying that that's higher than a lot of the others uh, on average that you work with. Sure. Um, so is that, you know, that sounds great. I mean, yep. it feels like, you know, we want to be at 100% or we want to be getting yes. there. I was just curious as to the, you know, the details of that as far as recruiting and retaining our police officers. Is that something that they look at? Is that something that's touted? Is that something that just is is helpful to the CFO and, and the policymakers? Yeah, or yeah. no, gr great question. Um, I don't think the 95% funded ratio is looked on as a recruiting tool or anything like that. It's you, you want to have that elevated. Um, you know, if there's a plan that's 50% funded, and believe me, there are plans that are, have a 50% funded ratio. Um, an officer may you know not want to work for a city that that that's in that sort of situation. Here, you know, I, I don't know how much of an attraction it has, but it's certainly a very good place to to, to be in, in terms of attraction and retention of, of police officers. To me, it's more of a benefit level issue. You know, what, what are the benefits being offered? And, you know, if they could get slightly higher or lower in a, in a neighboring city, that's going to be the appeal or, or the drawback of, of a particular city. Great. Did that answer your, yeah, your question? Yeah. Okay. Thank you. Sure. And I have to say, I guess I've been on the dais longer than, than anyone else in here. But um, when I first came on, before we issued the pension obligation bond, um, that was a very major issue nationally. I mean, there, there are municipalities that were on the verge of bankruptcy uh, because they could not meet uh, their, uh, the actuarial number. Uh, so uh, to, to see where we are uh, over the 90% threshold is a tremendous uh, testament uh, to Mr. Parks and his team and uh, the prior uh, leadership of the city uh, to position us uh, you know, I think all we have to do is make sure that the pension fund recovers more than 3%, right? I mean, three and a half, I think it is. Three and a yeah, half. Yes, yeah. uh, we've been fortunate. Um, but if return, I guess we only made 1% to 2% this year. So right. hopefully that's not the canary in the coal mine, meaning exactly. that we're in a downward fashion. But we've had some good years, and that $13 million is certainly a nice, uh, of unrealized income, is a nice cushion to have. But the value of uh, the what, what the pension obligation did, bond did for our city uh, as compared to other municipalities, uh, not only the state but around the nation, uh, really put us in very good stead. I, I, I agree. Yep. Uh, any other questions? A very fine report, very good news. Uh, yes. How often do you get back to us to report? Once a, um, every six I, months? I think it's every year because okay. we do our valuation reports every year. So usually we wait after we present that report. And believe me, when, when I tell you, we go through this report very thoroughly with the board. You have a great board of trustees that, that ask great questions about this. And they, they uh, make decisions based on this, you know, in terms of investments. And they have a lot of professionals to help them with that. So it's a... Uh, it's a very, and then, you know, my role here is really just to summarize it. I, I don't want to, again, take the two hours that I joked about um, earlier. But yeah, I do with was, the pension that board. Was, so. That was a joke, yeah. That was a <laughs> Any other, Jack, you're on the board, right? Any other members of the board here today? No. Okay, well. Uh, Jack Frost, and I have the honor of being the chair of the fund, but we have uh, some very, very good board members. We have the two elected police officers, Captain Joe O'Hearn and also Captain Troy Marchese. The mayor's other appointee is Craig Colley, who's a CPA who's been in town for a long time. And then our fifth member is Dana Fergakis, who's a trust attorney. Well, and thank, yeah, thank you all for your service. Uh, this is great news. It's our pleasure. and. Uh, also, on the plus side is by lowering the assumption rate over time that it gives us an um, easier hurdle to beat, which particularly when we see what's happened this past year, that uh, we're in a better position to deal with it. Okay. Very good. Thank you all very much, and thank you for the report. Thank you very much. Appreciate it. Okay.
Item two, uh, discussion on the uh, MWBE ordinance. Uh, Commissioner Riles, you want to tee this up? I think Mr. Sir. Hayden and his team are here to uh, present the report, but if you want to tee it up. Yeah, I, uh, I uh, asked um, for, for this discussion today um, because I have, uh, I just want to have an understanding of what we're doing to address the um, disparity that was found over, um, I would imagine it was about 10 or 15 years, and uh, how we are monitoring, um, making sure that uh, we don't get back in that position again. Uh, and before Mr. Hayden uh, begins his presentation, I, I want to remind the commission that uh, when I came on, uh, I moved Mr. Hayden over to uh, report directly to me because that's the importance of this issue in my mind. I wanted to make sure that we, uh, as an administration, were doing everything to keep our eyes uh, on uh, the the performance. And, and so uh, Mr. Hayden is part of uh, my team, uh, knows to, and he's the face of, of, of the MWB program and gets out to the community, but <laughs> one of his primary responsibilities is to make sure that we're doing what we said we were going to do. So having given you such a warm introduction, Mr. Hayden, uh, you can begin speaking, sir. And thank you, uh, Mr. Mayor. No pressure. <laughs> Ma Madam uh, President, uh, commissioners, uh, as indicated, my name is Frank Hayden. I am the director of the Office of Equal Opportunity. and. Based on that, maybe I should just quit and go right into the question. <laughs> no, no, no. All right, thank you. Um, uh, Commissioner Riles and, and the other commissioners, uh, uh, thank you for raising uh, this issue. Uh, because if my memory serves me correct, uh, the majority of the board w were, not, were, were not here when we started on this journey of uh, creating um, the MBE program. So this will be a good opportunity to, to educate uh, the others and uh, to make sure that we're heading on the right path. Um, I pushed the up button, nothing happened. Oh, the down button, okay. So they keep me away from electronic things. Uh, let me tell you about the, some of the existing procurement programs we have. We have a local workforce. Uh, the commission adopted uh, this. And that is that on construction projects that if 35% uh, of the work is site work, which in another word is labor, 15% uh, of that uh, would go to local individuals in that geographical uh, area. We monitor that participation on contract. Uh, you also adopted a living wage uh, ordinance. Um, Effective October 1, uh, that is uh, 15 bucks an hour. Prior to that, it was 14 uh, bucks. Uh, we monitor that as well. Uh, we have a, a SBE program here uh, that has been in existence for, for uh, a good while. And now we have our new uh, MBE program uh, that was adopted. Uh, this program went into effect on uh, April of this year. Now it was adopted by the board uh, uh, last year. Uh, we worked very closely with uh, the legal department to put together the uh, language of the ordinance, uh, what the program would look like and so forth and so on. And then based on that, uh, uh, it went into effect in April. Uh, to date, we have 25 certified uh, uh, MBWBEs. Uh, we are reciprocal with the Palm Beach County uh, and with the school district. Uh, the county uh, has 157. Uh, the Palm Beach County schools uh, have 239. And let me kind of explain what it is. The, our program is different from that of the counties and the school system. It's different in that theirs is controlled by size. In other words, they are small business program, uh, $9 million for construction, uh, $5 million for uh, professional service. They use that same dollar standard for their MBEWB program. 
So a number of their individuals who are already certified as SBEs can automatically transfer over to the MBE because they meet the size standard. Our program is uh, there is no dollar size standard for the MBE, WBE. You only have to meet the ethnicity standards in order for you to be certified in that category. Mr. Hayden, before you move off that slide, uh, the, the 25 certified MBE, NWBE seems small, but uh, I, I shouldn't overreact to that because we, are, we have reciprocity with, with some of these other jurisdictions. And, and you're absolutely right. And uh, uh, we have been working very hard to increase that number. Uh, as you know, we have outreach events uh, on a quarterly basis uh, where we share with uh, the general public uh, these opportunities that exist here. Uh, we had one where we just dedicated that to certification uh, to help explain to individuals about uh, the opportunities about being certified. So yes, you should be. I am alarmed, but we'll, we're going to increase that number, and you're absolutely right. When we put things on the street, we reach out to the county, we reach out to the school system to get their listings of certified individuals so that we can include that in the solicitation as well. Is there an advantage to someone being certified with us directly uh, as opposed to relying upon reciprocity with, with the school board and the county? No, there's no advantage. Um, I just prefer that even though you might have been cleared by somebody else, I'd like for you to fill out my paperwork as well because I, I will share this with you. Uh, we have found on at least two occasions uh, some firms who were certified by uh, the other entities, as we looked into them, they did not meet the requirements. Wow. And when we raised that to the other entities, they also decertified those individuals. So even though uh, we have reciprocity, I am still feel a lot better uh, that when I look at you, I know exactly who you are and what it is that you've done. Okay. Thank you. Um, one of the other questions that was asked in terms of the process that, that we go through in terms of determining uh, participation on our project. So uh, the process includes the project manager, the purchasing agent or contract specialist, a member of the Office of uh, Equal Business Opportunity. Uh, we sit down and we have a discussion with them and we come up with the best strategy in terms of for that particular solicitation. Uh, it might be we can piggyback off of uh, an existing uh, uh, contract that was competitively bid. For those items that are less than $50,000, we require at least a minimum of three quotes. For $50,000 or greater of a solicitation, we have to go out for a competitive bidding on those. Uh, the decision to use an SBE, MWBE participation in gold or sheltered market and et cetera is in construction. Uh, we can do either of those uh, for professional services and commodities. Should point out that <clears throat> we cannot shelter projects in the professional service category, but we do do that in contracts and in commodities. In terms of the disparity study, just letting you know about some of the things that were recommended by that. Um, in the construction for under a half a million dollars for the SBE program, we used a subcontracting goal of 15% or sheltered market. Uh, under the MBE program, use the subcontracting goals that African Americans is 11.17. Uh, uh, Hispanics, uh, Caucasians, and there's a use of a 5% bid equalization for up to 25,000, or we can use the sheltered market component. For professional services under 350,000, the SBE program used the 15% SBE goal or sheltered market. And I need to take it back, that's not, we cannot shelter pizzas under the professional service, so I apologize for that. Under the MBE program is the use of subcontracting goals and you should know that on the professional services, the, 
goal for the African American is 9.9, .9, and you should understand that during the disparity study, it was only the African American uh, owned firms who there, there was a disparity on the professional service side of, of work. So whenever we sub for opportunities uh, on the professional service, that's the target amount for the African American firm. And then it goes on to speak to you about the goods and services uh, sides of that where we can shelter those uh, commodities or use a goal of the 15%. And under the MBE program, it is the use of a 5% preference and the equalization system of up to 11,250. Yes. For our compliance, Ma oh, oh, I'm Madam, sorry, excuse uh, me. Yeah. Can, can you explain uh, the equalization? I've not heard that concept when it comes to procurement and MWBE programs. Yes, ma'am. Doing, doing the disparity study, the uh, Mason Tillman group who looked at our uh, piece indicated to us that we could use this 5% preference or we could use the equalization system that um, a percentage of the uh, item under the uh, goods and services could be uh, uh, used as an equalization. We have not used that, but it was part of the piece that came out during the disparity study. So it's the flip side of preference. Yes. Okay. Yes. Commissioner Rawls, did you have a question? Yeah, I, I, I my, my question kind of goes back from the beginning. Uh, you have 25 uh, companies that are certified currently. Currently. Yes, sir. Can you tell me how, what's the number of contracts that have been issued to minority uh, vendors? That is zero. Okay. Thank you. Madam President. Can you talk a little bit about sheltered markets? You've mentioned that a couple times, but I haven't seen a description of that. Um, under the shelter market program that uh, uh, the commission adopted uh, back during the S for SBE program, and we'll also have it under our M MBE or MWBE program. Um, we have to have a minimum of three firms who can provide that particular service. If we have those three firms, then we can shelter that uh, service so that only certified SBEs can propose on that work. The dollar threshold is less than a half a million dollars that we shelter project. Uh, we have sheltered a number of, of those up so far. Uh, we have some mowing contracts that we have sheltered that are with our parks and rec. Uh, some work for uh, HCD uh, and some housing rehab, we have sheltered those. Um, our handyman contracts, we have sheltered those so that we um, give an opportunity to those SBEs who don't have to compete <coughs> or wouldn't have to compete against the bigger players to participate. May I follow up? Yes. So I'm confused then, because you're saying we've given contracts to minority and women-owned businesses, but just to Commissioner Riles' question, you answered that we gave zero. So what was that zero to? The, the zero was under the MBEWB program. Under the SBE program, we've done sheltered market. We have just been fortunate that those firms that won the contracts under SBEs happen to be minority-owned firms. Interesting. Gotcha. Thank so, you. So does that mean, and, and, and the MWB program has only been around for six months, right, since April? It has only been officially in place since, since All right, April. So, yes, so does that mean that no MWBEs have benefited from the program? I mean, have they been subs on any contracts? To, so no dollars in six months have been, maybe this is on a later slide, have been paid to any MWBEs in no, six you, months? No, you are correct. There have been no dollars under the MWBE program. Okay. Uh, but as I said, there are SBEs who happen to be minorities who have gotten work but we count those dollars as, as the, SB the SBEs. Okay. Yes, sir. Okay. Since we're on this topic. Sure. Of the, of the 25 who qualify within West Palm Beach, I understand you're saying that we are doing workshops to do outreach to them. Is there more we could be doing to be reaching out to them? And is, is that an issue? Is that we don't have, 
um, uh, a good quantity to select from, or what? What is the issue? Um, I, my own personal opinion, is um, it is a new program. Uh, the advantage that the school system has, in my opinion, is they've had an MBE program for quite a while. Um, like the 10 years, 20 yeah, years? Yeah, close to that. Okay. Um, um, and so this is a new venture for us. Um, we've got to be able to convince people there are opportunities here by, by making that happen. Um, we have a solicitation that just came back in uh, a few days ago, under our general engineering service contract, uh, we received 78 or 87, 78 uh, firms submitted. We had uh, subcontracting opportunities for MBEs as part of that. And so as a result, depending on how many firms we end up selecting, uh, that will be our first attempt in the area of in being inclusive of MBEs as part of our project. Um, one of the other things is, is that after this, we'll be putting more out with MBEs on it, which will, in my opinion, force people to come out and get certified so they'll have an opportunity to participate. So I think we'll, you'll see your numbers. As we go through the slide, I'm going to show you a, a, a pro process that we go through of tracking dollars and how well, in my opinion, we've done with their SBE program. And I think as we move into the MBE program, we'll do even better in terms of dollars being spent. Mr. Hayden, because uh, I think the county came out with their program just before we did. Do you know how many, and maybe that was on that earlier slide, mm -hmm. uh, how many uh, MWBs the county has? It looks like. 157, or is that small and minority business as well, right? There, yes, sir. So do we know how many MWBEs the county has it's established in their time? 57 for them. It's 157 for their MWBE. Oh, oh so it their is 157. The program is just called the NEST. Okay, MWBE. okay, all right. So, they're, so they, they have, have 157. Bit, they got a little bit of a head start on us then yes, in sir. terms of the numbers. Okay, very good, thank you. Commissioner Riles, did you have a question or comment? Yeah, I. So, tell me in terms of the contracts that have been issued since April, have all of them had an MWBE requirement? Since April. Yeah, that's when you start the program, correct? No, sir. They have not. Why? Because, Commissioner, we didn't have anyone within our pool to be able to put a solicitation out on the street to have MBE participation as part of it. We had to build up our database to be able to have that and available. I don't know how, you know, in, in the, when we reach out to the county and to the school system, we ask them for the names of their certified individuals as well to, us, to participate. But we have just not had the data to be able to make that happen. And so we concentrated most of our effort over the last few months of getting folks certified to be a part of our program. Well, I don't really understand that. Um, I, don't, I don't understand that because, you know, uh, I come from the mindset, uh, if you build it, they will come. And if you gave if you put the contract out and you had an MWBE requirement, I'm certain you would find some MWBEs to participate. Is, or, do you believe that to be untrue? No, sir, I do not. Okay, so then why didn't you have an MWBE requirement in the contracts? Because at the time, Commissioner, we did not have any to participate. I could have put it out on the street. You're absolutely right. They could have applied for it, and they might have been certified as an MWBE. But as I stated earlier, we have found that uh, certification through other entities does not necessarily meet the requirements that we set. 
And so I, would, I feel a lot more comfortable when I have certified a company that I know that they are certified in that particular category. Yes. Who does the certification here at the city? We do. We as in you and this young lady? And Yes, sir. And there's another young lady that does the certification. So you got three people doing certification. We have, yes, two people doing certification. And do you have an outreach program? Yes, sir. And what's that? We do a quarterly outreach. Um, every quarter we do one. We also have what we call a business to business where we invite firms in-house to share with our project managers their, what services they provide. Um, stop, stop there. Tell me what that means. I, I don't know what that means. Well, a, a company does marketing, for example. They're a small business. So we will invite them to come in and do what I call as your dog and pony show. We get those project managers in the room who could use those services so that they can hear the pitch from that individual. And that way, these folks get an opportunity to talk directly to those individuals who can use their services. And it has turned out quite well because a number of firms have gotten work out of the city because of that process. That's your minority outreach? That is one of them, sir. I just said we do community outreach as well where we go out on a quarterly basis and have meetings. Well, you started in April, so that means you've gone out once. No. No, we have been out more than once in April. I said we do one uh, at least once a quarter plus our uh, other programs we do, we partner with the school system. If they have an event, we participate. If the county has an event, we participate in that as well. We just finished with our matchmaker piece in September where we also talk to folks at that event as well. So whether or not we do it, we partner with other agencies to make that happen as well. And I might also add, I mean, if commissioners, if you are aware of businesses, uh, this goes for the entire commission, <coughs> through your travels, through your districts, and through the community, uh, please uh, send them our way. I mean, I think the, uh, the first indicator of uh, the key metric is going to be the number of businesses that are certified in our city. And we're, we're looking to grow that. Um, okay, continue with, you. Uh, yes, Ms. Ms. Johnson. Yeah, yes, let me sir. just ask a question, and, and I don't want to confuse programs, but just based on my experience with uh, MWBE programs, typically when you are putting together the bid, you look at the availability of those particular firms for whatever service you're going out. Does our program operate on that basis? where you look for the availability and then you determine whether or not you have availability and then include it in whether you're doing the RFP, ITB, or what have you. Yes, ma'am. Okay, and when so, we do, I'm sorry. So given the uh, contracts that we have let between April and up to the one that you have now included it in, you all did an analysis of the availability of MWBEs and made a determination that we did not have any that was certified, so you were not in a position to include it in the RFP. Yes, ma'am. Okay. Okay. Continue, sir. Thank you. Sir. Uh, in the compliance uh, process, uh, we use a PRISM software for tracking. Uh, there are three compliance letters that we send out. First is when a vendor is awarded a contract, we send them a letter that uh, lays out for them those items that we expect them to submit to us when they uh, apply for payment that will allow us to determine whether or not they are paying or utilizing their MBEs or SBEs. Uh, then if they have not met that criteria, then they'll get a letter from us that is monitoring that basically indicates to the vendor that according to our records, um, you have not made a payment to your SBE. And if our records are incorrect, would you please uh, uh, correct our records? If uh, we have, and in that thing, we give them 30 days to make that happen. Uh, if that has not occurred, then they will get a non-compliance letter from us, 
which will indicate that if they don't make the improvement within the time frame stipulated, that <clears throat> we can withhold their payment or they can be deemed non-responsive uh, in terms of their contract. Uh, to date, we have not had any of that to occur. This is basically that we have not had any contracts with our MBE program over the, next, over the last six months. Uh, we just talked about the one that uh, we had 78 submittals that came in on the 9th, and there was a MWB uh, sub-consultant goal of 9.9% on that. This is a report that we do quarterly <coughs> that uh, talks about, uh, shows up how our expenditures are going and captures those dollars that are being spent with the SBEs, uh, whether they're a subcontractor or whether they are a prime contractor. Last year, for the whole year, uh, we did roughly about nine, a little bit more than nine million dollars in that area. <coughs> this year, that number is 14 million dollars that we have spent in that area. This will be the same process that we'll use when we're tracking the dollars for the MBEs and WBEs on our program so that we can be assured of the fact that uh, we are spending the money properly in those areas. And you should know our percentage is 15% on our contract. And this year we're up to 20, a uh, little over 23% in terms of those dollars that we have spent with our certified SBEs. And it'll be the same thing when we get with our MBEs. This is where these ordinances. Yeah. Oh, hold on, Mr. Hayden. I'm sorry. Uh, Mr. Fauna has a question. Just Armando Fauna, Assistant City Administrator, just to clarify, because you had mentioned that some of the SBE uh, contracts are also minority women owned firms. So yes. is that breakdown available? I think that may be significant in some cases to be able to showcase that, even though we haven't had any new contracts for the six months that the, uh, that the program has been in place, we may already be meeting some of the goals under the SBE. Yeah, we could, uh, uh, we can break that down uh, to make the help with that determination. Commissioner Rawls. Yeah, I have a question. Now, mm -hmm. you indicate that um, you had no data on the minority firms, correct? I had, yes, sir. Okay. So then how could you make a determination of availability if you had no data? I, well, if, when I said we had no data in terms of when we were putting solicitation out on the street, I need to know who I have that's available or certified to participate. That was the data that we looked at. We determined we did not have any. So how could you make a, an availability determination? I'm, I don't. I don't understand, Commissioner. When you say available, there were no companies certified. Yeah, right, you had data. Right. Well, I had. I didn't have any data of those certified individuals. I had data of certified SBEs, but it was looking for the MBE participation yeah. on the project. Okay. But but I think it's safe to say we will continue to work hard. A to build the number of, the, uh, of uh, certified MBEs in our city. Yeah. And we will continue the aggressive outreach effort. Is that safe to say? Um, yes, sir. Don't mean um, to put words in your mouth. Yeah. No, I, and, and uh, Mr. Mayor, I, w I will say that uh, uh, we, in procurement when I was a part of it, and now in this new rule, we take very seriously creating opportunities and working very hard to bring about some opportunities uh, for our folks. Uh, I have been extremely frustrated over the fact that we have not got as many certified MBEs and WBEs in our program. And we've worked very hard in terms of attempting to make that happen. And I'll, I will confess to you, uh, this time next year or at the end of this quarter, you will see some numbers where we're providing dollars to uh, MWBEs within this program because that's where we're functioning and working on. Commissioner uh, Nero, did you have a? Uh, are you done? I, I'd rather wait till you're done because I have a couple questions. I, can wait. <laughs> I, I guess I'm done. <laughs> no, don't be done. <laughs> Madam President, did you have? 
Sure. I had a question. I do have a question. So. Okay. Did you want to go? No, I, I made a statement and I wasn't sure, so you just went like that. I was asking. But oh, I'm sorry. I'm sorry. You were, okay. I didn't want to cut him off as well. No, I was I'm, saying. I'm, so that's I'm fine. I'm just, okay, Commissioner Neary. Thank you, Mayor. So, um, under the uh, shelter, I want to go back to the, uh, the question around the sheltered market. It, it was my understanding just from um, that disparity study, but maybe I heard it wrong and I'm not sure <clears> if you presented on it today, but we, can that be used? Can sheltered markets be used in an M uh, a, um, MBE? Yeah. Yes. Yes, sir. So this is, they absolutely can be used? Yes, sir. MBA. Okay. Right. All right. Um, the other thing is you talked about, and I think we went a little bit into this, but we talked about the availability. Mm -hmm. As a part of the disparity study, that was articulated, right, to a certain degree in terms of what um, what the availability was in, the, in at, almost like in concentric concentric circles, I guess, you know, here in uh, West Palm Beach, Palm Beach County, and then maybe Southern South Florida. Yeah. So are we you are we then using that information to set the goals for each contract? How are we How are we coming up with that? Like, because you we talked about a a nine point nine eight uh, MWBE subcontract goal on I think this latest contract that went out. Right. How how's that number determined? That, that percentage. That percentage was determined by the disparity study. That as they looked around, uh, they determined that it was nine points nine percent less than ten percent disparity of African American firms for. Uh, professional service on their end. And so that's the number that we use. It's based on that number that was developed through the disparity study. Mm -hmm. And then I, I think just a comment. I mean, I, I, we, I'm preaching to the choir here, but, you know, a, a policy is only as, as good as, as how it's uh, enacted. Um, and I think and I know that this particular program and the work that we're trying to do here is, is quite frankly, new to the city. We, we've done uh, not just this commission or this administration, but just when you go back to the history of the city, we've done quite a bit of lip service. And now we literally have a tangible tool to use. So I, I sense, and this is me calling it out, I sense a frustration in this, and I think it's partly because now that we have a tool, we have to get beyond, and again, this is, I, these are my comments, and, there's, and please, I don't want anybody to come away with, you know, I'm not throwing rocks here, but we finally have a tool, and we, got, we have to get beyond just to talk about it. So to your point, Mr. Hayden, you said in a year from now and six months from now that we're absolutely going to be able to see, or we should be able to see um, a change in that, and that that's not just on you, that's on the city in general. So I wanna be clear about this. I mean, I think we all, all of our feet are to the fire on this um, particular policy. But again, my comment is any policy is only as good as, as, as how we, um, uh, we enforce it, how we enact it. And I'd like to see where we have on a regular rotation. And I know we've talked about it, but I, I still can't recall where we've had um, developers in the five years that I've been on this day is to say, you know, we're going to do X, Y, and Z, um, and, and uh, we're going to have JAR training programs, and we're going to have, um, we're going to make sure that uh, on our site that local folks are, are benefiting from it. I've never, in the five years that I've been on, and I've, I've said this before, I've never had that group then come back to us, or, or the city, quite frankly, come back to us and show that those things have happened. So I think that's the frustrating, at least from my standpoint, that's the frustrating part. I am happy that we actually, we have something now very tangible. Um, it's all, all the legalities have been worked out and it's really the enforcement of it. So that's more rhetorical than anything, but uh, I, I do hope that in, in six months from now, in a year from now, I'll just say six months from now, that we're at a much different place uh, in this. Again, this is a six-month program, and if I uh, recall your presentation, Mr. Hayden, you proposed to send to the mayor and the commissioners 
uh, a, a dashboard report similar to what on, on this program, mm -hmm. similar to what you've been sending out on the SBE program. We have okay. the we have the um, technology in place. Uh, we have the ability to monitor those dollars, and you will be producing this report on a quarterly basis. Is that correct? Yes, sir. Okay. Now, as to the point about whether any projects, development projects, have performed, I urge any of you to talk to the developers of the Bristol project uh, and, and hear what their uh, numbers have been, uh, because they have, uh, from, from what I've heard from them, uh, exceeded uh, the promises that were made to uh, the City Commission. I don't know, I don't think you were on there uh, on the days at the time, Commissioner, uh, when they were getting that contract. So that's one example. Uh, there may be others out there, but uh, if you're looking for tangible evidence of developers who have performed, I, I encourage you to get the information from the, from at least the Bristol. Uh, Madam President, you had a... I do have a couple questions. Thank you. Um, I appreciate what you were sharing with us about the... Um, opportunities that you're providing where the minority and women-owned business owners can present to contra existing contractors. Did I understand that correctly? Um, is it, is beyond that, are there, how do contractors identify MWBE organizations to be able to work with them? Or is, uh, I don't work in that industry, so I don't know if that is just known. Do these MWBE organizations um, identify themselves? I'm sorry? No, it's a whole database. That, that's, that's the and point of Madam, getting Madam them President, to register. Uh, when we do a solicitation, um, we provide a list of uh, certified individuals who can, um, who can perform uh, in that area that we're doing a solicitation to. And that's based on the 25 that we have. And, that, and not only the 25 we have, well, as I said, we reach out to the county to find out if they have some individuals in that category and also to the school system. So the list we provide lists okay. all of those entities out there uh, to let the vendor know that these are the ones that are available in those categories. Okay, great. Thank you. And my second question is, of, so we have the 25 who've qualified. Are there business owners who have approached us, uh, the city, to apply for this program who maybe didn't qualify for other reasons? Are there other, you know, I'm not sure, their business plan or something that we are providing assistance or coaching or pointing them in the right direction or, or helping them get their feet underneath them to be able to qualify? Um, the answer to your question is uh, yes. Uh, most folks who apply for certification, um, if they are denied, uh, for example, under the small business program, they would be denied because they didn't meet the dollar uh, threshold or they hadn't been in business long enough to meet the, the uh, requirement. Under the MBE program, uh, the only thing that would keep you out is if you propose to be X and it turns out that, that, that you're not that. But aside from that, yes, uh, in answer to your question, uh, we have met with uh, some local banks, for example, because we know that their upfront funding is a problem for a number of firms. Uh, they have agreed to uh, uh, offer assistance to those, whether it's a line of credit, upfront funding uh, for these firms as long as they meet the requirements that the, that the banks uh, require. We're having some discussion with some bonding uh, firms uh, who have programs to assist uh, minority-owned or small businesses who need some bonding. Uh, we have relationships with SCORE and some other entities that if you need some help formulating what your business plan is, that you can go to those individuals to help and, and work out in that regard. So yes, we will do all that we can to assist individuals to get to that level that they need to be to uh, be successful in, in, in the business. Because we, we want to uh, uh, 
help these people become successful and if they're qualified to perform the work, we want them to have an opportunity to do that. Thank you. I think it's also important that while we may have 25 MBE certified, those 25 don't necessarily have qualifications for every contract that comes before the city. Uh, for particular goods or services. So you can't even say that the universe of potential MBEs to respond to a particular contract is as broad as 25. Is, is that's, that, is that's, that? That's, that's very true, uh, Mr. Mayor. And, uh, and, and you, you, you really don't, uh, don't understand how difficult and how hard it is that we work uh, every day. Uh, to get more people to come in uh, and to participate in, in what it is that we're, we're providing here at the city. In a variety of areas, yes, whether it's yes, certain sir. goods, whether it's certain services, so, so that we have a very broad universe, uh, an inventory of businesses that can respond right. on any given day to any given contract. Yes, sir. You're absolutely right All about right. that. And, and like I said, we, it, to us, it doesn't matter if it's a 4000 3000 5000 or 20 some thousand dollars. As, as you all are aware, uh, 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 B. D. Stevens uh, built a fire station for us, so it was $5 million. It, it's the only African-American firm which has built a fire station at, that I'm aware of in the county for that sum of money. We have an African-American firm which is renovating the Sunset Lounge. Uh, that dollar figure, I think, is going to end up in somewhere around $12, $12 million. I mean, so we, we are making some inroads into that. And I, that's why I say I think at the end of the day, uh, you all will be very proud of what it is that the city of West Palm Beach is doing uh, to assist individuals in that area. Commissioner Rogers, you have a question? Yeah, I just had one. And, and I don't mean this disrespectfully. Yes, sir. Uh, Mr. Hayden, how many... MWBE or MBE programs have you participated in um, implementing before this one? When I was with the city of Detroit, I created their MBE WBE program, and it was the best in the state of Michigan that existed there. When I came to the South Florida Water Management District, they had an MBE WBE program, but the governor at that time decided that we'd have Florida first. So I developed an SBE program for the South Florida Water Management District. Within that program, I developed a number of pieces that we had in the old uh, the sheltered market and so forth so that I know I can target for those small businesses. So, Commissioner Riles, in, in answer to your question, I, this is not my first rodeo, sir. But, but you would agree that, that there was a disparity found at the South Florida Management District? It, before I got there, they had their MBE program at South Florida. So that, what happened was the governor decided that we did not need that program, so we had to create a small business program. So I don't know what happened before then because I didn't come to 2001. Right, but yes, from 2001, and the disparity study was just recently done, so there was a disparity over that 10-year period of time. There was no disparity study done at South Florida. Yes. Not, not at the Water Management District where I work. Okay. Solid Waste Authority. Solid, 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 solid Waste okay. Authority, right. yes, sir. There you. was one done there. And, and Commissioner, I would tell you, when I first came to the city of West Palm Beach uh, a little over six years ago, uh, that commission at that time indicated that they wanted to do a disparity study. And I'm going to be very honest with you. I, I have a problem paying someone to tell me something everybody knows that we've been discriminated against. But we did it anyway. And we came up with it because we knew that there were disparities out there. But the federal law requires us to prove that it exists. And so that's what we did. We had to prove it. And I'm, I'm, I'm telling you, sir, as I stand here today, uh, before I'm finished, you're going to be very proud of what it is that the city of West Palm Beach has been able to do. Commissioner Neary. Thanks, uh, Mayor. Uh, so, Mr. Hayden, quick, quick question. One of the things when we adopted the disparity study, one of the questions that I had asked was, 
is there a possibility, would we consider retaining um, support given the bandwidth of, of, of the city? And that, that's not to say that we don't have uh, experts in-house to do that work, but there's a finite amount of um, resources. And so one of the questions that I have is, are we doing that? Are we working with anyone or did we retain anyone to, to help implement this program? That's one question. And the other question is, or the other statement is, I've seen where, the, where we have commissioned studies um, and we have held on to those consultants to help us implement uh, those measures. So I know that there's a history of that. So the question is, are, are we using uh, any outside um, resources, Mr. Hayden, to, to help us implement what is new to the city? Not new to you, <laughs> but new to the city. Um, I, that's my question. Um, I think we're using outside resources, and those outside resources, resources are the community. We are not paying anyone. Uh, to come in and assist us in where it is that we need to go. Um, and I'm always open for help. Uh, but once again, I, um, I think through the help of our legal department and, like I said, people in the community, I think all in all we've, we've done an excellent job in terms of where we, where we are. Uh, but I'm smart enough to know that you know, if I'm given the directions that we ought to make that happen, we're going to go out and find the best we can to assist us to get to where we need to be, sir. All right. Any other uh, questions, comments from commission? Thank you very much, Mr. Hayden. And I look forward to hearing uh, additional uh, reports uh, quarter, six months. Well, I do have a question Thank that. you, sir. Uh, okay. I'm sorry, Madam President. Well, um, you mentioned these reports. I'm just wondering if these quarterly reports could be more than just the, the data and the numbers, which is very important, but you mentioned the Bristol, and there might be other stories that could be told that then inspire others to want to sign up or get involved or follow through. Anado an anecdotal information yes. in addition to the, the, the data. Yeah, we, we can we, certainly work we, on, yes. on, on We on can that. take a look at that. Thank you. Absolutely. Right. Thank you all very much. Appreciate Thank it. Thank you. Uh, I don't have anything on Mayor's Matters, um, so I will declare this meeting adjourned. Meeting's adjourned. Thank you. <laughs>